Good morning. I'm Good Johanna. morning, Johanna. How are you, Phyllis? Fine. How are you? Very happy to be here in Adana by Zoom. Um, I'm delighted to be able to offer a presentation on conflict cuisine, something I study, building communities around the table. Uh, this is a subject that I have been working on for the last five years. And I'm going to share some slides with you, and we're going to have a conversation about conflict cuisine and all its implications. It's an important concept, uh, Johanna. Why did you create conflict cuisine? What well, was the motive behind that? Well, I'm glad you asked because I've done many things in my life as a policymaker, but as a teacher, I wanted to see the impact of food on international relations. And about five years ago, it became really clear to me that the kitchen had become a new venue of foreign policy. There was a connection between food and the way governments and citizens use what we eat to send messages, messages about history, persuasion, and one's homeland. In the city I live in, Washington, DC, I discovered an urban laboratory right at my doorstep. And I could see through the lens of food how conflicts, especially recent conflicts, had impacted our own city's cuisine. In fact, in Washington, some people say that the cuisine of Washington, D.C., which used to be Southern food, is now the food of the world because we are a city of diaspora people. And what's interesting is, oh, I would say 20 years ago, a member of Congress said, you could always tell where America was at war because every time a new ethnic restaurant opened, the restaurant represented the nationality of the country that we had been fighting with. So in the 60s and 70s, especially in 1975, we had a flood of Vietnamese refugees and we have a huge Vietnamese population and eating center. Then we had Afghanistan after the Soviet invasion and we had a large number of Afghans who came here. And then in Ethiopia, there was a civil war and Washington, D.C. is the second largest city after Addis Abeba in, in terms of Ethiopians. And we have a large Ethiopian population. And then came the Central American Wars. And we also inherited lots of refugees from El Salvador, where there was a civil war, from Guatemala, where there was a civil war, and Nicaragua. So the city not only had an influx of people who were immigrants and refugees, but we also had an influx of people who were using their food to earn a living and also to connect with their homeland. So let me digress and just talk a little bit about how conflict and food are related. Yeah, I was going to ask you, Johanna, what do we know about food and conflict? How did you bring these two words together, the concepts? Because when I look at food, when I think about food, I have positive connotation. But when I look at the other word, conflict, it has a negative connotation. How did you bring these together? Well, one thing is that I studied many countries that were coming out of conflict. Mm -hmm. At the end of the Cold War, we know that there were many countries trying to rebuild the countries of the former Soviet Union, but also countries that had experienced a civil war. And one of the interesting phenomena that we see is that conflict and food are very tied together. And it's go grown more and more obvious as the United Nations has even recognized this by having a Security Council re resolution that talked about the link between war and food. That was in 2018. And there was recently a meeting of the Security Council that looked at this issue because we know that food insecurity is a major problem and that when looking at food insecurity and the sustainable development goals, that in order to achieve zero hunger by 2030, we're now racked by a lot of different problems. So last year in 2019, there were 1.25 billion people who had moderate food insecurity and 750 million that experienced severe food insecurity. But the majority of people who are hungry in this world live in countries that are racked by conflict. And that's really a terrible statistic. Because if you look at my next slide, the World Food Program reports that 60% of those who are food insecure live in conflict-affected countries, 
And the countries in the list, there are eight of them on the right, have the greatest food and security need, food security needs. One other thing that's really very sad, and we all are experiencing this because we have a pandemic, is that COVID-19 has further affected food insecurity to the level that some at the United Nations in this recent 75th General Assembly recognize that we may not reach the global end of hunger by the year 2030 because COVID presents yet another problem of food insecurity as people struggle to eat when they have no work. And let me add just one last thing, Phyllis, is that climate change affects all of us. And the United Nations, UN High Commissioner for Refugee, as well as other agencies know that we have climate migrants. Some believe that what's going on in Syria and other parts of the Middle East, in addition to governance questions, is affected by climate. Because as drought grew, people migrated to urban areas. And urbanization creates its own problems. It creates instability when people have no work. It creates anger. It creates hunger. And if you look at this slide, the link between hunger and instability, mm -hmm. it, if you look at the drivers, resource competition, market failure, and extreme weather, we're all suffering from extreme weather, high heat waves, droughts, sea level rises. And we also know that if the, it's combined with questions of governance, where a government is not taking care of its citizens, it creates people who are angry and upset. And that creates instability. And there's also greed, which further instability. So this is a circle. You get food insecurity and instability. One drives the other. Yeah. And that's really the link between food and war. Yeah. Climate change is a big uh, you know, event. I mean, it's affecting uh, food insecurity and it's creating instability. And as you said, this closed circle instability, again, creating food insecurity. It's true, and the predictions out of the UN and the Climate Change Commission uh, that the United Nations have predict that we are going to continue to see climate migrants for yeah. years and years because unless there's a dramatic change in how we address this, uh, people will continue to be on the move. So we can, that's the subject of a whole other lecture. I hope and I can come back, but this is how I have recognized how important understanding food, food security, and cuisines that people bring with them when they leave their countries is so important. Yeah. Citizen diplomacy, gastro diplomacy, all these are growing moments. Could you please tell us more about this, Johanna? Sure, and that's what really is a component of conflict cuisine. We all know that food is a way of expressing power. We have hard power, which is as everybody knows, the use of weapons and guns in war, but soft power is persuasion. And I think that what we understand as soft power is the way food is used to level the playing field, is the way food is used to persuade. In the pictures you see on your slide here, uh, the top right was the conference. Actually, Adana is very famous for culinary diplomacy and soft power because it's where the Allies met during the Second World War to figure out a strategy. And food played a major role in the Adana conference as well as the other conferences at Potsdam and Yalta, uh, Yalta to help soften the relationships between very different actors, uh, Roosevelt and Churchill and Stalin. Uh, that is a really interesting story. And the pictures you see here is in the United States, the government in 2015 started a, a chef's corps, a corps of chefs who could use American cuisine going around the world to promote it. And it included very distinguished chefs. It was a project of the former Secretary of State, Hillary Clinton and John Kerry, who used food diplomacy very, very carefully. And then the picture at the bottom of your screen is the negotiations on the um, Iraq uh, nuclear talks. But there was an interesting story about that and food as well, because coming together, two teams that really didn't have any personal talks together came together around a, me a Persian meal that was offered on the United States Independence Day holiday while they were all in Switzerland. 
And some people feel that that meal made a big difference in the ultimate outcome and the ability to get a treaty. So food is definitely a piece of soft power. Now, all this all goes to what we know as culinary diplomacy, which is the use of food and cuisine as an instrument to create cross-cultural understanding. But let me be clear, culinary diplomacy is a function of governments. And what we're seeing today is the continuation. It's one of the oldest tools of international relations, but it also is a, a very important part of soft power. And that is something to consider because the French believe they started culinary diplomacy. Of course, it's a big debate, but one interesting story is that after the Napoleonic Wars uh, at the Congress of Vienna, they invited uh, Talleyrand, invited his chef, Marie-Antoine Karim, who most people in the food business know, to create French style dishes and cuisine at that event. And it was a very important component of that whole Congress of Vienna. So we do know that culinary diplomacy has an important role. But mm -hmm. I also want to get to what I call gastro diplomacy. And you mentioned that, Phyllis, as well, because here is a picture of citizen food diplomacy. Gastro diplomacy is soft power as well, but it's a more democratic form of soft power. It's not run by governments. It's actually how citizens show others from other countries what their food tastes like. And it's a way of bringing people in to a conversation that's not threatening. And it has a very important role because how do we learn about other cultures? We learn about them through our palate, through the way we taste. And eating international cuisines can really promote greater understanding among different groups of individuals because of the flavors and the ingredients that they didn't know before. So gastro diplomacy, which is something that we're going to talk about a little bit more in relationship to this project we did in Turkey, is also a people-to-people -people role. It's a manner in which food is used to shape and expand perceptions. And I think that that is something that is really very important. Mm -hmm. yeah. And just to go back, we, we were trying to figure out this picture of Anthony Bourdain, the late Anthony Bourdain. He loved to travel around the world and eat food. And this picture we think was taken in Besiktas, the famous uh, kebab uh, place. Yeah. And the picture on your right is also how in the United States people taste new food because across the street from the Smithsonian Museum, people can get lunch at any of these various uh, food trucks that offer a wide range of ethnic foods, from kebabs to Burmese food to Mexican food. And so people are tasting the world and they don't have to leave their homes. It's a wonderful uh, project. I mean, I like these, uh, you know, trucks serving food in front of the museum. <laughs> yeah. So one other interesting part of gastro diplomacy is nation branding. And that has become a very big business. It relates to the government, but it isn't run by the government always. And one of the things that food is declared is an intangible cultural heritage. So many countries compete uh, submitting different dishes to UNESCO to become uh, part of what they declare are intangible cultural heritage components. I know, isn't it true, Phyllis, that the city of Gaziantep is considered a creative city, and some of that is based on the cuisine. Exactly, yeah. I but worked I also, with the team, uh, you know. Yeah, no, I know you had a big role in it, but UNESCO branding mm -hmm. gives a country a great ability to promote tourism. Mm -hmm. So the other examples you're seeing on your screen, Mexico's program, which is called Mena Comer, Korean gas nation branding, and Peru, which has a very robust nation branding component is used to promote tourism, but also to promote the natural food resources of a country that makes their cuisine so distinct. Yeah. And this has become a very important factor in tourism. About 60% of tourism was really based on people wanting to taste different foods, according to the World Food Tourism Association. And tra tragically now, nobody is moving around the world because of the pandemic and it's had a severe impact on tourism. I'm sure it's impacted Turkey the way it's impacted Europe and the United States, but um, people actually travel to eat. Yeah. And that is a very sad component now. 
yeah. of what's happening. Unfortunately, Joanna, COVID affected especially the tourism sector and gastronomy sector. Uh, I am sure, I mean, I do hope the, the inventors, the investors, the academics will find a solution doing such things online. How gastro diplomacy was used to promote social integration among hosting communities, Syrians, and other refugees? We work together in a project. Please let me hear your insights. <laughs> well, it's fortunate that we had a great advisor like Phyllis, who is an expert on uh, the cuisine of Turkey and the Levant. But this project called Livelihood Innovation Through Food Entrepreneurship Life which is a very good name and acronym, uh, created a way to use food as a bridge between refugee populations coming into Turkey and uh, Turkish citizens. And it's important because food crosses borders. It doesn't know the border between one country and the other. But it also created a way for Syrian and Afghan and Yemeni refugees to also speak with Turkish citizens. And even with the language barriers, though we had translations, women and men who were in this program began to recognize that they had much more in common than they thought. And people who started out not wanting to talk to each other, learning food entrepreneurship, by the end were very happy to be part of a program that showed that cooking could actually bring people together, not only as friends, but as business partners and let them use their entrepreneurial skills. So one thing that we did, which was to promote this even further, was to have the refugees and Turkish citizens who were involved contribute refugee uh, cook recipes to a cookbook. And what you see here on the screen now, the cuisine of life, recipes and stories of new food entrepreneurship in Turkey, shows how important these recipes were in creating a tangible record of what people brought with them, the memories of their homeland. I wanna add something interesting to this conversation and Phyllis knows all of these people personally because she worked with them in testing the recipes, <clears throat> is that today cookbooks featuring refugees and immigrants has become a growth industry in the publishing area. Between 2015 and 2020, on Amazon, just doing a survey, 17 cookbooks featured refugees and 30 were written by immigrant chefs. And immigrants quickly discovered that their recipes are important and often they're not written down. As Phyllis can testify, many people who brought recipes to this program never had them in writing. They had them in their head. And that's another feature of the food of conflict cuisine. These are traditions carried from generation to generation. And when you document a recipe and put it in a book and test it, the question has always been, does it stop the, ch the changes, the dynamism of food, or does it freeze it in time? And that's a question I'll leave to the audience, but it has sparked many conversations about ingredients. It has also re made people recognize the commonality of spices, the commonality of procedures and methods in the kitchen. And what's most interesting, as I say, is that when you transcribe a recipe, you're watching someone prepare a dish and it's very hard work. Um, you have to measure everything and you have to create it in a way which is usable. But why do we have cookbooks in the first place? We have cookbooks so people like me who live in Washington can replicate these foods and taste other cultures. So this is the connection between this project and gastro diplomacy. You can create social integration, not only by working together in a kitchen, but someone thousands of miles away from Turkey or from Syria or from Yemen can actually replicate what people are cooking and taste something of the homeland that they've lost. And I think that that is a very important component of what we achieved over the last three years in Turkey in addition to training hundreds of men and women in food entrepreneurship, we also were able to document the cultural dimension of food, which is a very important part of conflict cuisine. Yeah. I, I wanna just leave you a um, information, but Phyllis, why don't you talk a little bit about how this cookbook and your work in it came to be? Yeah. And we'll post here ways to access it online. First, yeah. 
Yeah, for proceeding uh, on my uh, connection with Life Cookbook, uh, with Life Project, I want to tell, uh, announce that please take a screenshot of this page because Life Cookbook is available on Amazon and also it's available as ebook, you know, on the, the, the last uh, link. Uh, thanks to you, Johanna. Thanks to Ayla. Uh, thanks to Mary and Stephen from SIP. Uh, it was a wonderful project and I had the chance and privilege to work as a co-editor with you and with Ayla. Uh, my two years in Istanbul with Life Project, with uh, beneficiaries, with members. At the beginning, uh, some of them, not all of them, some of them sent wonderful recipes, great recipes. Some of them just sent ingredients. Some of them sent wrong ingredients, but as a result, they were full of enthusiasm and motivation because that cookbook was their cookbook. That was their story. Uh, the cookbook was not only a recipe book, it was also a story book. It was also a motivation book for the entrepreneurs. So I am grateful the whole team who contributed to our cookbook, live cookbook, uh, I hope new cookbooks will come out uh, uh, around hosting communities and refugees around the world. Uh, again, Johanna, your contribution was great. Ayla's contribution was great. And also your idea of including food people, people who are from UNHCR, from James Beard Foundation, from Gastro Diplomacy, all those people also contributed to our cookbook with their essays and articles. Thank you, Phyllis. And I say that that's, um, if you just screenshot this, as Phyllis said, you can find out a way or at least look at the website and see if it really gets you excited. Yeah. Um, let's finish up. Uh, you had one other question for me about. Yeah. Social gastro gastronomy. Uh, gastronomy, positive sides of conflict cuisine, and how do they promote greater social integration? Because this is a trend in all over uh, the world where refugees are moving around social integration, social inclusion. How does gastro diplomacy or gastronomy influence us? So I see social gastronomy, the definition is on the screen, is that food becomes the means. It uses the power of food and gastronomy to address social problems, inequality, nutrition, to educate consumers about diets. And that's another component of the broader way that food and conflict are lived, linked because this is a mean social gastronomy is a movement that teaches people skills to survive but also uses food as the tool. The picture of Chef Hurst who actually visited Istanbul to teach some of the uh, people in the food incubators in Istanbul is one of the leaders of the movement. He runs a program in Brazil that teaches youth in ghettos, in the favelas there, about cooking and helps them get jobs. But social gastronomy has become something that chefs around the world and famous ones use. So Massimo Baturo, who ran one of the most popular restaurants, a Michelin star, three-star restaurant, the number one in the world, also contributed during the Milan Food Fair when he used food waste, food that was left over, and invited chefs to cook and fed homeless people in the station, railway station, at a church in Milan. And this movement of repertorios exists around the world. And of course, the world famous chef Jose Andres, the Spanish chef who opened many restaurants around the world, is also now a leader in humanitarian support as he feeds people who are victims of hurricanes, victims of any kind of natural disaster, and today he's feeding people who no longer have access to food because of the COVID pandemic. These are examples of social gastronomy. There are many more we have not had the time to talk about, but projects like this, and I'm sure there are many in Adana and many around Istanbul where people are feeding other people, once again shows the power of food and the impact of conflict to integrate into society. These are other pictures of social gastronomy programs. Conflict Cafe in London uses the recipes of refugees to teach people about different parts of the world. And this famous project, Enemy Kitchen in Chicago, which also has a branch in London, was run by an Iraqi uh, gentleman who wanted to show people around the world that there were wonderful cultural dimensions of Iraqi cuisine 
that should be thought about as a way to bring people to a better understanding of the citizens of Iraq, not the government. So food has this very powerful way of bringing people together in different manners and also highlights the con conflict uh, that is going on. Now, I don't think we have a lot of time left, Phyllis, but I think we should wrap up by talking about what we started, uh, about the positive dimensions of conflict cuisine. What, what would you like to help us say in, in the conclusion? Yeah, food as a tool for so social integration. As you said, uh, power uh, of food is inevitable. It's so strong. Uh, I experienced in life project when I was uh, collecting the recipes, testing the recipes, meeting with the beneficiaries, working with you, working with Ayla. It is inevitable. So I would like to announce and give the message to the audience, to the listeners, that please use food as a soft power please use food as so, for social integration for social uh, innovation for social entrepreneurship food connects everyone and uh, one of my friends told me many many years ago when i was in greece she was a greek journalist she said nobody fights over the food around the table it's true and one interesting phenomena and i will share with you just a few pictures I took last summer in Adana uh, because I had the pleasure of visiting your lovely city with Phyllis and our team is that I was just amazed by how beautiful the food areas were. Uh, this was in the Syrian neighborhood, but it could have been anywhere, as Phyllis said, uh, because uh, it shows the integration of different cultures in a city that is close to a conflict zone, but also has to survive. So I'd like to thank you and finish with one last observation that the consumer psychologists have even looked at food consumption and it's a cue of trust when you eat with somebody. It changes group behavior. When you consume food together, you increase trust and it actually helps improve negotiating outcomes. So there is the link with diplomacy, with citizens, and also it suggests that there is a direct connection between building peace and building trust. And at the end of the day, that's what we really want to do with food. We want to survive. We all need it to survive, but we also need it as a way to create greater stability and trust in our world. So I want to thank you. Thank you, Johanna. It was a wonderful presentation. And thank you. Hopefully next year you will be in Adana. Physically. I hope so. It was a beautiful city. And um, thank you again to the organizers of the festival. I hope this has been helpful and have a wonderful conference. Yes, have a wonderful conference. Thank you. Yes.